Welcome to our session, which is a guide to how to prepare for a successful orchestra audition. Um, if, if you wouldn't mind, those of you who are sitting further to the back, if you, would, if you wouldn't mind moving a little closer to the front, I think it'll make it easier for us to communicate with you. And also, when we get to the point where we have uh, question and answers, it'll make it easier to go through that process. So uh, we're going to go ahead and begin. This session is about how to prepare a successful audition uh, for an orchestra. And your panel is is me. Uh, my, I'm, I'm Weston Sprott. I'm a trombonist with the Metropolitan Opera. Uh, to my left here is Ryan Murphy, who's a cellist with the San Antonio Symphony. Uh, to his left is my good friend Joy Peyton Stevens, who's a cellist with the Seattle Symphony. And to her left is Valley Phillips, who's, in, who's a violinist with, with, the, uh, with the Oregon Symphony. So over the last couple of weeks, we've gotten together and we've talked about different things that we think are important to being successful in an orchestral audition. And of course, if we went into granular detail, there's a million different things that we could say and we could probably spend the next three weeks talking about how to successfully prepare for an orchestra audition. But we decided that we would try to be a tad bit more generic in our explanations about certain things and then go through this preparation or go through this um, this presentation and give you the opportunity to come up and ask different questions. Uh, just looking out, I see a handful of faces of people who look like they're probably taking auditions. You're at that age, you're out there trying to do these things. And this panel represents people who have a wealth of experience doing that. I would imagine with all different types of degrees of success and lack thereof. I, if I speak for myself, I've won auditions. I've been in the finals, been in the semifinals, been not in the semifinals, uh, you know, haven't gotten through the list. Every imaginable thing you can think of, I think, is represented here on this stage. So uh, a lot of open-minded people, please feel free when the presentation is done to step up to the microphone and, and be open and candid with your questions. A brief overview of what we're going to talk about is right here. We're going to talk about basic standards, uh, preparation, the psychological aspect of taking auditions, how to handle yourself on the day of the audition. A lot of people talk about how to prepare for the audition before, but never really get into all the different things that, that happen to you when it's crunch time. Um, and then, of course, different misconceptions that people have about auditions and, of course, some resources that we think could be useful for you. So to go over standards, uh, Valley is going to take, take that. Okay. Hello, everybody. Um, as you know, I'm Valley Phillips. Um, I guess I want to say that, first of all, Everything I say is really going to come from a, a string perspective, specifically a violinist perspective. I've been on uh, committees for other instruments, but obviously I spent most of my time uh, judging violin auditions. I was principal second in Minnesota for 10 years, and so I spent a lot more time listening to auditions than actually playing auditions. And when you do that, it really changes your perspective on how to take an audition. So with that in mind, okay. Looking at the standards, in tune, very obvious. I'm trying to go through these quickly. In tune is really clear. I assume no one would question that one. In time, when you're on a committee, as we've all been on committees, um, the instant someone starts playing, people start tapping. So I want you to just put yourself in that mindset what it's like to be sitting there listening to 80 candidates, 100 candidates. As soon as you start playing, people just start doing this. So when you deviate from what is, uh, would be considered someone's normal, just inner pulse, that gets people's attention. So people just, you know, they're listening to you and you go, da 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 little dum bum bum da 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 You know, and everyone kind of goes, like this at the same time, like because it, it's disturbing. So um, <laughs> sorry, it is. <laughs> it is. It, that's what I mean. You, it's. it's I'm, I'm kind of glad to hear people laugh because I'm thinking this should be really lighthearted and not so serious. So, right. but but it, I, I don't want to lie to you. I want to tell you how it is on the other side of the screen, and it it's kind of dis disruptive to people and they it makes them feel a little funny, so they just have a negative vibe about somebody, you know? Um, beauty of tone, if I can spend a little bit of time on that. Um, beauty of tone wins jobs, hands down. 
your sound quality wins jobs. I've seen sound quality trump all sorts of things. Um, from the committee's perspective, probably 90% of the people that show up to take the audition have no business taking the audition in the first place, let's face it. Most of the people you hear, you're done after 30 seconds because you realize immediately that they're not of a certain level. When you hear someone begin and their tone is very beautiful, it gets everybody's attention. Everyone's ears perk up and they sit forward like, oh, <coughs> here's someone that has potential. This person could get the job. And we want to find someone. It's not like we want to spend three days listening to people play excerpts so we can say, you know, we're better than everybody else. We hired no one. Yeah. No one does that. We want to find somebody. You don't join the dating site to not find a date, just to exclude <laughs> it. You know? So think about it that way. When someone starts playing really well, you want their spiccato to work. You hope they play in rhythm. You're like, oh, don't mess this up, because you sound so good. You know, Please just play everything well. You know? So uh, keep that in mind. Um, also keep in mind, when you listen to uh, a singer, like say you go went to hear uh, Renee Fleming or something. You wouldn't come back and say, well, how did you like it? Well, she had amazing diction. No, you're going to say she sounded incredible. That's why she's famous, not because her pronunciation of French words is spot on. You know, and as a string player, we, we very often get caught up in, am I doing the right bowing? Did I play on the right string? Did I, you know? sound good, work on your tone, work on your forte tone. Uh, what's next? Accuracy. Okay. Accuracy. Okay, again, self-explanatory. We can go into detail later if there's time. Dynamic contrast. I don't know how many people played on Thursday, but I would say that even though it seems obvious, a lot of people play between mezzo piano and, oh, should I? Yes. Okay, sorry. I'll, how's this? Is this better? Okay. A lot of people uh, play basically between mezzo piano and mezzo forte. You know, um, knowledge of stylistic nuances. Uh, a word about this, I would just say, always sound like the piece. People are looking for someone who has experience, who knows the rep, because you have to rehearse things in a hurry. Um, when I first joined Minnesota, it was over the summer, and they, every week we had two different full-length subscription-type programs plus a, uh, a waltz concert program. So we had three different programs every week, four weeks straight. You don't have time to rehearse everything. They don't have time to spoon feed you, so we need to find someone who knows how th things go. It's a real huge turnoff when someone plays Brahms for it, it doesn't sound like Brahms. Um, yes, yeah, I'm getting nods, so that's good. <laughs> um, other than that, I would just add, do what is customary. Very often there are things that everybody does. Um, let's say it's a dynamic change or a push and pull in tempo, but it's not actually marked in the score. Do it, because if you don't, you, it just announces to everybody, they don't have the experience, they haven't played this piece, and that's actually something that really factors in um, when you're deciding who you want to pass on to another round. There you go. Thanks. All right, so the next part we'll be talking about is just organization and some tools you can use to kind of get yourself um, into a routine. You know, it's really important when you're taking an audition to have everything so that you're not searching for your music, so that you know where everything is, just that you don't have to deal with um, the rigmarole of, of trying to track down sometimes 20 or 30 different excerpts. So the first one here is make a booklet you know, of all the excerpts you need. Um, you know, if, whether that's a photocopy that's bound. Um, I personally don't do that. What, what I do do is I mean, I've got a stack of excerpts probably that thick from all the years, some obscure, some I use every day, but I've got folders and I make sure to keep them all very organized. I try and keep them in the same order um, that they are on the list so I know where everything is. When I wake up in the morning, I get done with my scales, they're all right there and I can worry about just the routine of practicing. But if you can get it bound, if you can get it um, in a book, spiral uh, bound or whatever, that is super, super useful. 
Um, another important thing is to make a playlist of all of the excerpts that you'll be performing and of the sections you'll be performing. It's really important, something that shows up on the other side of the screen to know the piece really well. I mean, it, it seems again kind of obvious, but you will be focusing for hours and hours a day on your own part in your own little microcosm world of um, whatever symphony or work you'll, you'll be playing an excerpt out of, but it's important to know the other parts that are going on um, so that you can make informed uh, musical and tempo and all those other kind of decisions that, that you'll be making um, during your preparation. So get a playlist together. There's iTunes, there's all sorts of, um, there's YouTube, there's CDs. If you've got a listening library, all of that stuff is, is really great. Find multiple recordings. You know, there's a lot of orchestras have a lot of opinions on how things should sound um, and they'll be different and it's all, it's just good to have a really well-informed uh, ear in that regard. Um, the next two, a metronome and tuner, again, these sound super simple, but these are, these should be your absolute best friends, closest confidants um, while you're practicing. I almost never leave home without it should be your uh, motto here for, for a metronome and tuner. Um, tuning especially can be very subjective, like, you know, whether you've got perfect pitch or if you've just got a really good relative ear. Um, I'm sure if anybody's ever been in a quartet or any sort of chamber group, you can argue till the cows come home about intonation, but a tuner solves that debate right away. So <laughs> definitely try and take one of those out and again, use it as much as you need. Um, this next one maybe gets a couple of boos, a recording device. Um, it's important to be your own best teacher. Of course, it's great if you can play for other people um, you know, and have the list that you should give to other people, but really, if you're able to do it, to record yourself, to listen to yourself, maybe the day after or you know, not right after, but at some point, and then be you know, just very gently critical. You know, we don't need to get down on ourselves. It's, it's not productive, but listen to yourself and say, what can I do better? What am I already doing really well? That's also just as important to recognize what you're already, where your strengths are. Um, it can be a pain, but you know, it's, it's very, very, very useful. Again, you're your own best teacher. Record yourself, super useful. Ryan, why would, why would that one get booze? I, you know, for me personally, and for a lot of musicians, recording, just the, the whole process is, is a little painful. It's just, you know, it's just like, ah. Like when you hear your, a recording of your own voice, like if I watch this tape back later, I'm probably going to do I really sound like that? Like, ugh. It's the same way, you know, when you're sitting, and I tell this to my students all the time, what you're hearing from, in our case, behind the instrument or the instrument under your ear, a recording d device, even 10 feet away, is going to pick up some stuff that you might not be hearing. Um, or some stuff that you are hearing that is different. It's, it's not, these instruments were not to be made to play here. They're meant to be played over there. You know, that's, that's where the sound goes. And that's where your, your opinion needs to be. That's where your ears always need to be when you're listening. So, yeah. And then a Bluetooth speaker can also be um, very, very useful for um, just, it's less chords, it's great. So, yeah. <laughs> so especially if you're on the road. I mean, there's a lot of times where you're traveling and, uh, you know, it's nice to have speakers to again play recordings so that you're not listening on headphones. So, okay, uh, moving on, we were, I was going to talk a little bit about making sure that you develop a practice plan. Uh, everyone does things differently, but I think the most important thing we can impart to you is that a successful audition regimen is is very regimented. You know, it's very organized and well planned. Make sure that you do that. You don't ever want to have too many moments of indecision about what you're planning to do, and with that in consideration, that's why the first bullet point I have here is that you should begin with the end in mind. I always try to think about that when I'm preparing for something, whether it's a recital or an audition. You should be asking yourself, how, how do I want to sound? How do I want to feel? What impression do I want to make? Um, and as it relates to your practice schedule, create these different goals. One of, one of my favorite quotes was from Al Sharpton. I wanted to share it with you. He says, I tell young people that you can't arrive someplace until you determine the destination. It sounds simple, almost cliched, but it's an inescapable truth. If I'm at the airport, I can't buy a ticket until I know where I'm going. That's the first thing they ask you when you step up to the counter. Next, you have to deal with the cost. This is the price of the trip. So are you willing to pay the price to get there? So before you start just you know, pulling the excerpts out of out of your booklet and planning and starting to practice, you should be asking yourself, where do I want to be? Do I want to be in the Philadelphia Orchestra or the Oregon Symphony or whatever it happens to be? How do I want to feel about my audition? What impression do I want to make on these people? What do I want them to think of me? And that should be your guide for everything that you prepare when you practice. 
you should be thinking, how do I want to feel physically on the audition day? How do I want to feel mentally on the audition day? If you start with these things, then when you're building your practice plan, you'll be able to make sure that your practice plan is in line with your, your, finished, your finished product goals. If you don't, then that's when you start running into problems. We're kind of preparing aimlessly, and that's a sure sign of, of a failure that is on, on the way. Um, with regards to creating a regimented practice schedule, I would say make sure that you create short and long-term goals. You should definitely schedule your practice in advance. I usually try to schedule my practice at least one week in advance when preparing for an audition. I'll usually sit down on a Sunday and I'll plan out what Monday through the following Sunday will look like. Uh, how many hours do I want to practice on each day? How does that go in line with the different other work that I have to do? If you're playing in ensembles, if you're in school, if you have an orchestra job already. Um, what is, how many hours do you want to practice? What do you want to practice during those hours? How are you going to separate which excerpts or which fundamental things you're going to do? How are you going to balance what you're practicing with what you have to play? Uh, especially as a brass player, we really have to manage our endurance and our just general level of fatigue. It's always something we're thinking about. Um, also, when you're practicing, make sure that you isolate these fundamental issues. You know, you heard Valley talk about people are always tapping when you start an excerpt, or Ryan was talking about playing with good intonation. I always go back and I make sure that I play through an excerpt focusing solely on intonation. Then I play through the excerpt again focusing solely on rhythm, solely on making the phrase, and try to put those things together so that when you listen back to yourself with your recording device, ask yourself, could I write down, or could someone on the committee write down an actual dictation of what I just did? If the page was blank, could they say where my phrasings go? Could they say exactly what the rhythm was, exactly what the dynamics are? Uh, and if you can accomplish that, I think you'll have a very good chance of being successful at the audition. Uh, the last bit on here is make sure you establish a consistent feedback loop for yourself. Uh, one of the biggest problems that, that people have is they practice and practice and practice, but they don't constantly provide feedback. Feedback is where your greatest improvements come back come by. So always be taking lessons, be playing mock auditions for people that you respect, record those mock auditions and see if the comments from those people line up with what you hear, or you know, are your ears similar to what other people's ears are like, or is there some type of disconnect between what you're producing and the feedback that other people are giving you. And also have a process for measuring your progress. Um, I tell students this all the time, where you're you're undertaking a long process of preparing for an audition, maybe two or three months, and it's very easy to put yourself in a vacuum of it's either good enough or it's not. There's a lot of space between not good and prepared, and you should be able to, to process those, those different improvements. You, know, you may look at something and say, most of the time I'm out of tune in a particular excerpt, but if a week later you've you fixed 20% of those things, if you're not actually measuring and paying attention closely to what you're doing, you may listen back to and just say, well, I still play terribly out of tune and not actually take notice of the fact that you've actually made an improvement. And if you continue to make said improvement over the next several weeks, that you'll be where you are. Um, and the last part of this is try your best to play for members of the orchestra for which you're auditioning. Uh, I think that can be very, very helpful. Sometimes they have insider tips on different things that are liked. Uh, what, what was successful at recent auditions, what wasn't successful, things that a particular music director may be looking for, and that can be very helpful for you. Okay, so um, we just wanted to um, put up the sample practice regimen, and this is sort of the practice regimen that I follow when I'm taking auditions. Um, obviously, there's a lot of detail on here, and I'm not expecting you guys to like write everything down or even like absorb all of it right now, but I just wanted to illustrate how detailed it is and how detailed it needs to be in order for you to get to the audition day feeling prepared and not burned out. Um, so there's just a few basic elements to a practice regimen. Um, uh, for most auditions, you have at least like an hour's worth of music that needs to be under your fingers and ready to go. Um, you're not gonna practice an hour's worth of music every single day effectively, so it's helpful to divide the list into manageable pieces. For me, I divide the list into three. 
Um, and so I'll see one third of the list one day, the second third another day, and so on and so forth. Um, then you want to separate out different elements to focus on. We've been talking about intonation, we've been talking about rhythmic integrity, um, what the panel is paying attention to behind the screen. So those are things that you want to separate out and focus on one at a time. Um, so for me, I always, uh, in the first practice session, I'll do drone pitch solely for intonation and I ignore everything else. And then in the second practice session, I do metronome for the first little bit, the first large bit, I do metronome at half tempo focusing solely on rhythmic integrity. Um, so if my intonation is not so great, then I don't care during that practice session because I'm focusing on just that one particular thing. Um, uh, and the third element of this is obtaining feedback, um, which we've already talked about because it's very, very important. Um, you can think that you're doing something and you don't know that you're not doing it, not achieving that until you listen back on your recording or you're playing for somebody and they're like, oh yeah, I, I totally did not hear that. Or you can think, oh, this is so hard, it's feeling really bad, it must be sounding terrible, and then you listen back to the recording and you realize, oh, it actually sounds fine, it's just gonna be uncomfortable and that is okay. And so understanding that is a very helpful um, element of that. Um, the reason why you want such a, a detailed practice regimen is because it's a very long process and the audition day and the the audition itself is a very stressful um, ordeal. Um, so it's kind of like if you imagine a soccer field, nobody is gonna be able to kick from one goal line to the opposite side and actually score a goal against a competent goalie. There's several players along the field and uh, when you detail out the practice regimen like this, the, this is, those are the individual players that are helping to propel your goals slowly but surely up the field to eventually score the touchdown. No, the goal. <laughs> <laughs> Sports. Um, get, cool. Get a home run. She plays cello, not soccer. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, so moving on. Uh, so yeah, uh, we just wanted to talk about a, an example excerpt um, and how I would like attack that and break that down. This is Don Juan. Um, most string players will have Don Juan on their auditions. What about wind players? Is that a Sometimes, thing? Yeah. Okay, cool. So yeah. like... Oboe players for sure, I see a couple. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, look at this thing. There's like so much detail. There's like, and it's Strauss. It's like flair and character and all this crazy stuff. You have duples versus triplets. Blah, blah, blah. For the first practice session, I would, like I said, break out the drone pitch tuner or even use open strings and um, go note by note, forgetting about rhythm. I, I basically play like straight quarter notes through the entire thing and just make sure that everything is exactly in the right place and um, in a predictable spot. Then take a break, go to work, go to lunch, whatever, come back, second practice session um, is metronome at half tempo I'm focusing solely on making sure that the 16th notes line up and that the triplets don't fall forward and all that good stuff, making sure that everything is exactly in the pocket rhythmically. Um, later on, after I'm you know, working things up to tempo, then I start to add in more detail, like uh, more uh, dynamic contrast, more articulation differences and that sort of thing. Um, and eventually then playing for people and making sure that I'm achieving what I think I'm wanting to achieve. Okay, so, um, the psychology of taking an audition or being a performer in general um, is all about quieting the mind. Um, and for our purposes, uh, it's sort of separate while you're preparing and the day of the audition. It's two separate um, skills. So I've spoken with many people this weekend and just in life in general, and it's a very common story to hear, oh, I, I practiced so much, I felt really good about how I was playing in the practice room, and then I stepped on stage and all of a sudden this voice started kicking in. Oh, that sounds weird. Oh, you just missed that shift. That means that you're you know, completely out. Um, so your inner critic will, will creep up on you and take any opportunity that it can to start messing with your mind and getting in your way. Um, and the end result winds up not being great. For me, the mental game is as vital to a successful audition outcome as preparation of technique. 
It is, however, rarely addressed. Um, so for a while, I floundered, and um, I had severe performance anxiety, and I realized that I couldn't possibly want a job um, or be a performer if I couldn't figure out how to fix that aspect of my uh, playing. And so I took some time to study it. Um, and one book that's really helped me is The Inner Game of Tennis. Um, it discusses uh, self one and self two. And self one is kind of like your mean self-important professor. It loves to give instructions. It loves to give criticism. It'll say something like, um, remember to start with a firm wrist. And so then, you know, the excerpt comes and you're like, all right, firm wrist, firm wrist, firm wrist. Um, and self two is the self that actually performs the action. Um, so I have to ask, is the constant instruction really all that helpful? Um, according to the friends that I've talked to over the years, once that instruction starts coming in, it's very difficult to get it to stop. As children, we have an innate and natural ability to learn how to walk. That's before we're verbal, before we understand English, before we understand any words. So how does that happen? Um, it happens because we naturally learn how to do things by observing and by actually doing them. Um, so it's very helpful to learn how to quiet the mind and make room for the innate natural learning ability. So how do we do that? During your preparation practice, um, it's very important to have non-judgmental observation. Um, there's a big difference between saying to myself, you missed that shift, you idiot, and <laughs> uh, versus you're, you're, that shift, you're going, it, it sounds too sharp, and so that means that you're going too far, and so next time, don't go so far. Um, it's the, you'll hopefully wind up with a similar result of you're gonna fix the shift, um, but your subconscious will take that um, negative criticism and start to uh, relate to it in a personal manner. And it winds up uh, degrading your self-esteem. Um, so, uh, during the actual performance, one helpful tool for quieting the mind is centering. Um, and centering is described in this book, one of my other favorite psych, uh, sports psychology books, um, Fight Your Fear and Win. Um, and there's several steps to centering, but basically you're gonna focus on breathing and fall into a regular rhythm. You're gonna release all the tension. You're going to use a practice cue. And a practice cue can be as simple as um, sing or purple velvet, which is actually a practice cue of mine uh, for like some brown stuff, just because, I don't know, it elicits quite, it, a picture is worth a thousand words. Um, and then, yeah, and then you release the energy and, and go for it and play beautifully. Uh, there's plenty more steps, but you get the general idea. Um, and the, that is to move from the left brain, which is all instructions, to the right brain, which is more pictures, feelings, and sensations. Um, you have to practice this. Um, you have to practice getting nervous. And that is recording yourself and playing for people. There is no way to simulate that besides just doing it. Um, and that's a big component of uh, learning how to combat nerves. Lastly, beta blockers. Um, hopefully you guys have heard of beta blockers. Does anybody not know what they are? Everybody knows what they are. Awesome. Um, beta whether you decide to take beta blockers or not is a very personal decision. Um, there is no right or wrong answer. I will say that I personally do use them and have found them to be very helpful and effective. Um, and the last thing that I'll say about beta blockers for the moment is that um, most people are using them. And so if you are opting to not use them, you may be at a competitive disadvantage. So that's something to take into um, consideration. Um, on the actual day of the competition, you want to be sure to frame everything in a positive way. Um, if you oversleep, that's great. You got some more sleep. If they ask you to play <laughs> something again, that's wonderful. They're really interested in hearing more from me. Um, everything is a lucky break for you. Um, focus on yourself. It does not matter if somebody just walked in that you know advanced at the last audition that you did not advance at. Um, it really the only person that you're competing with is yourself from the previous day, and that's the only thing that you can control, so control it, do it, take care of it. Um, and lastly, be sure to bone up on uh, reading 
and other resources to make sure that you're very solid on your tools uh, come the day of the audition. So be reading and be thinking about these things all along and don't wait until the last minute. Okay, so it's the big day of your audition. <laughs> um, couple of things just to help you through here. Um, first is the routine and to stick with what's normal. You know, if you're used to eating breakfast, for instance, in the morning and you eat a light breakfast and then for some reason I'm gonna eat a giant breakfast because it's audition day and I need the extra energy and you're feeling weighted down then and maybe a little sick, um, just stick with what's, what's been working. Um, this is one of those things where people kind of shoot themselves in the foot before they even get started. You know, don't change whatever you are doing. This also goes to um, your equipment. If you are used to playing on a certain type of strings or, you know, really wanting that last minute rehair or, you know, gonna try something new with your read or your breathing technique, I would suggest against it. You know, you've been working at the, to this point very, very hard on perfecting every single aspect and um, you wanna stick with what you've been doing. Um, and try not to get psyched out if you see other people doing other things. That's them. We all have our own roads. Stick on your, stay in your lane, so to speak. Um, when to arrive and how to dress. This, this is a similar point. And there are basically two kind of ways to think about this. And they both have to do with what makes you most comfortable. I mean, I've seen people show up to auditions in pajamas. Um, <laughs> You know, and it's, it's, that's fine, because a lot of the time the screen is up um, and, and they're comfortable, and again, that's what they've probably been used to when they're practicing at home, so that's fine. Um, me, personally, I tend to like to dress up a little bit, and I'm not talking like a three-piece suit and a giant tie and a pocket square. I'm, you know, just all black, something that's not distracting to me, something that's not going to be distracting um, to anyone else, because you will be meeting people that work for the orchestra on the other side of the screen. So we're talking about personnel managers, um, you know, other staff musicians, the proctor um, that's going to help you at your audition with any questions you have on stage will generally be a member of the orchestra themselves and probably even someone from the section. So just to look professional um, for me makes me feel the best. Um, and you know, you're, you, as long as it's not nothing too fussy, um, practicing in a button-up shirt and some slacks is, is nothing too crazy, I don't think. so. But either way, just again, don't change it if you've got a plan in mind, all right? Um, so food and snacks, they're are a couple different ways that orchestras audition. One is you show up and you draw numbers and then you play sometime that day. And then another is they give you a time. Um, if you get the, la the, the former rather, if you are drawing numbers, you could be at that audition for hours before you play, especially if your hotel's not nearby or whatever. So bring stuff to eat. Don't, again, bring food that's gonna weigh you down. Bring some stuff that's gonna give you a lot of energy, some nuts, fruit. Um, I would avoid fruit juice, stuff with fiber, you know, nothing too crazy, nothing too heavy, you know, and, and and again, nothing that's weird. I mean, if you've never had a goji berry in your life and you think it's going to be a good idea to bring to an audition because I'm a shaman said so, <laughs> and it gives you an upset stomach, you know, that's going to, again, don't cause yourself any problems. Stick with what you know. Um, you know, and again, these are long, sometimes drawn out, stressful processes. So, you know, if you need coffee in the morning and you're used to that, um, fine, make sure to get a lot of sleep. Um, and, and again, just... Be prepared for the long haul because generally there'll be two, maybe three rounds in an audition, but I've been finding and hearing very commonly that, you know, orchestras are instituting what's called the super final or the super extra duper final um, when they really can't decide. And again, you might play four rounds in a day and that takes a lot of endurance. So just be prepared for that. Um, there are generally going to be some things that may throw you for a loop. Something as simple as maybe the chair you like not being out there, or you're in a different room that you thought you were going to be in, or it's 65 instead of 68 degrees in the hall. Um, you know, take these, try to take these things and stride as much as you can, and mentally prepare for surprises and um, you know all the and disappointments going in you know you just got to be ready and hopefully your preparation is such that you know if something drops out of the ceiling you're able to still play through your excerpt without being too disturbed that's kind of the mindset you want to go in with um beta blockers again this is something that's very very personal and a, a, a tad bit controversial i think everybody is familiar but um Again, go with what you're doing and, and try to institute a beta blocker policy um, in your preparation when you're playing for other people um, that will allow you to be consistent. You know, if you're used to taking half a one or a full one in your mock auditions or in your recording sessions, then stick with that. You know, you, you need to know how it's going to feel um, so you're not kind of changing the dials right during your audition. Um, and advancing, how to adjust your playing for different rounds. Um, 
for me personally, I try and make sure in the first round when you're behind the screen because it's such a, sadly, a dehumanizing experience. It's exactly what we don't train for. We train to musically communicate with faces, with peoples, with, with emotions. There's a very important amount of feedback that comes from the audience that we don't get in an audition just because we need to remain anonymous and keep things as fair as we can. Um, so for me, in the first round, I just try and give them zero reasons to eliminate me. I, I might play a little more carefully, make sure I focus more on just everything being in tune, in time, with a beautiful sound. And then in the later rounds, to get a little more free and, and start really expressing myself a little more when they can see me. And again, that communication um, is taking place. So, And I think there may be a little bit of disagreement on the panel about that. Well, Ryan and I talked about this a little bit uh, yesterday. And I said, everyone has a different way of doing things. And a lot of people have won auditions with a lot of different strategies. Uh, for me, when I think of playing from round to round, I try to prepare a certain way on each excerpt and I give my absolute best in every respect on that excerpt. And not just, you know, some people feel like you play a more in the box version during the first round to make sure that you're in the safe zone. I, I personally have never felt that way. Um, and my feeling has always been that if someone votes for you in the first round, that you should do more of that in the second round. They liked it the first time, give them more of it again. And then if you get past the second round, do more of it again. Um, because for me, I always feel like it can be troublesome to second guess what people want to hear. You just have to play what you believe in, what's, what you're convicted by. Uh, and then hopefully, if that's what that orchestra happens to like, then when you win the audition and you start the job, you don't have to feel like you have to fake it all the time. You can continue being yourself, and that will be the person that they voted for. And do you guys have anything to add to that? And then lastly is, is feedback, again, the ever important feedback. So, um, you know, it's, you can play all the mock auditions and have all the recording sessions you want, but recording yourself in the context of an actual audition um, is an extremely powerful educational tool. However, a lot of orchestras don't allow you to have recording devices um, on stage recording yourself that, you know, you're gonna run into some CVA or union problems, um, and so, my suggestion is if you really want to record yourself to ask if that's allowed, maybe even you know, send an email to the personnel manager and see if that's something you'd be able to do or if that's something they would be able to do for you. Um, and if it's not allowed, I wouldn't push it. I mean, everybody's got a cell phone in their pocket and certainly I've seen people just turn it on and let it go during the audition. Um, and again, it's super useful if you can. Um, but I wouldn't push it because if you get caught, that could be real bad news. And it's one of those things where it's, it's just another kind of unknown, something that could make you nervous, so I would just avoid it if it's not allowed. Something that's probably more uh, probable is to get feedback from uh, the panel. So usually on a panel there's anywhere from four to eight to ten or however many people, um, and just to keep things straight, they're taking pretty specific notes on each person that comes through, and those notes can be made available to you. Um, what I would say about that is to never ask the person directly, you know, don't call them on the phone and be like, hey, I just played, I was number eight, can I see what you said about me? What I would try and do instead is to go again through the personnel manager, ask them if it's okay to get comments. Um, and most, uh, in my experience, most people are fairly happy to do that. It's a little time consuming um, for them to kind of dress it up and, and send it off, but it's something that can happen. And I've even gotten really lucky with some people where they call me and note by note, in my audition tell me what was right, what was wrong, and again, it's, it's super extra useful. Um, so if you can get lucky with someone like that, then absolutely, absolutely don't be afraid to ask, because the worst they're gonna say is no, okay? Ah, oh, that's me. Yeah. Um, in order to keep this short, um, just taking a quick glance over there, has anybody heard some of the things that are up on the screen? Some of the misconceptions out there? There, yeah? <laughs> Not too many, though. What about um, the first one? This one, I've heard a lot. Uh, elimination for minor errors. Um, you'll hear it, um, you know, if you do more than two auditions or something like that, you'll probably see some of the same people at auditions, and you hear people saying, oh, yeah, I auditioned over here, and, uh, well, I didn't make it to the next round, because, you know, when I got to the recap, I took a different, you know, they have all these reasons why they didn't get there and now that I've been on the other side for a long time I, I can guarantee that just does not happen for something small and again if you just think about what it would be like if you're on the committee you're sitting at the table and you know wow this violinist he sounded great 
I mean, his spiccato was amazing. His sound was great. His understanding of musical ideas was fantastic. Beautiful player. But he made a mistake in bar 11. <laughs> you know, that sort of thing just doesn't happen because you're trying to find someone to bring into the fold. Everyone makes mistakes. You're not going to lose a really good player because they missed a shift. Just doesn't happen. Um, winner is predetermined. Um, I can say, hands down, I've never seen anything even close to that. I've heard people think that has happened because, you know, maybe they hired a, a, someone who's a friend of the f somebody or the person who was there as the uh, acting person actually ended up getting the job. And it's like, no, I mean, they, they were just good, you know. Um, but I will say this about this, this uh, idea that it's predetermined. Um, at some point, the screen comes down. At least you hope to be playing when the screen comes down. Um, yeah, if you want the job, right? Um, and at that point, you have to realize that the people, I mean, they're people on the committee. They, they're human beings. They have biases. And you really need to work at eliminating, or I should say, not giving a committee member any ammunition that they can use against you. So what I mean, let's say it comes down to two people, man and woman. There's someone on the committee that's just like, you know, we need more guys in the section. So he's going to do whatever he can to convince the rest of the committee that the woman isn't as good. Well, if he doesn't have the ammunition to do that, he's going to have a really hard time. So he will either say, there's nothing really negative I can say where I'll look credible and he'll shut up. Or he'll try to go for it anyway. And then everyone will see his bias out in the open and they'll ignore what he has to say. And that was generally my approach to taking an audition. It's like, I don't want to leave any little detail overlooked. Um, and let's face it, it was in part because of my appearance. I don't look like the typical classical violinist. I did not want to give them any ammunition to say, oh, we shouldn't ha hire Val, we should hire the other person. I wanted to make it so that everything I played sounded like it was very well uh, prepared, so that if anyone said that, they would look stupid, frankly. You know? And that really should be your goal. Don't say like, well, most people don't play that passage very well, so uh. You know, no, you should be the one person out of 100 that plays it really well. Don't, uh, again, this is string player bias, but vibrate everything. Someone's going to vibrate everything. It might as well be you. If you don't, you're the one that's going to play for, this, for the violinists in the room. I don't know how many violinists are in here, but um, Don Juan. Sorry, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sing or scat or whatever you call it. And all the violinists go, uh, <coughs> you know, and it's like, why did you play that eighth note like the ugliest, shortest, hackiest you could possibly do? Someone is going to go, bum, bum, and that's what's going to sound better, when, especially when you consider that you're playing in a hall, everything you do echoes. You, so when you go, uh, it just rings for all, and just people like, oh, you know, it, it, I, I just can't tell you how, how often something like that happens. Even if it's not a short, ugly note, it's something where it's just a passage, a lyrical passage, and someone takes the time to sing every note in the passage, and you don't. You know, it, it's, it's something that you, you actually have control over and it's actually something that's fairly easy to control but you do have to think about it you do have to practice it um, sorry for dwelling on that uh, first person in each hour will not advance no I can just say hands down no maybe the first person will end up playing longer than everybody else in the first hour as the panel is trying to adjust their time you know how they're how much time they're gonna give each candidate but uh, it doesn't work like that must play a very specific style. Okay, um, I've definitely heard this one quite a bit. Um, 
I would say rarely that's almost true. Every once in a while you have an orchestra that is really finicky about something, but in, in general, if you look at an audition list, look at all the things you have to prepare, all the different styles that you have to prepare. If you play your Mozart, it sounds like Mozart, and you, and you play your Strauss, it sounds like Strauss. It's fine. If you're a really good player, the people in the committee will say, look, they'll adjust. We tend to not play our Haydn in that style, but clearly they're a good player. They'll adjust. It's fine. You know, I wouldn't worry about that. Um, being asked to change is a negative. Uh, yes and no. Um, I would say for the most part, it's not. So you can say as a rule, I wouldn't think, oh, if they ask me to do it again, it must be bad. I have to say sometimes I've been on the committee where something was so bad that we felt like, why don't we just ask them to play it again so maybe they'll feel a little bit better on the second time, you know. But those are, it's really rare. For the, for the most part, um, they are interested in you and they want to see how you can um, adjust to uh, instructions. Um, as an example, when I auditioned for Minnesota, I, I did get the job, but I'm playing Mendelssohn Italian, and I'm smiling because it was hilarious. I actually cracked up behind the screen, um, you know, silently, of course. Um, so I play, I play the first page and that little bit of spiccato of Mendelssohn Italian, and I hear, um, could you do that again? And this time, if you could play a little faster, a little lighter, and a little cleaner. And I'm thinking, well, at least I played it in tune, but <laughs> aside from that, <laughs> it must have been really, really bad. And, you know, so it's like I did my best. I, just, I mean, it didn't feel that much different for me, but my, my point is that it's not a deal breaker. If somebody asks you, if they ask you to do something again, don't, you know, bow your head, like hang your head in shame, like, oh no, that's it, I'm done. You know, it's like, no, it, it really doesn't mean that at all. The last slide that we have before we take uh, some questions, if you have them, is just a, a list of some resources that I think might be helpful to some of you who are looking for further information after you leave. Um, of course, finding out about auditions, the International Musician, if you're a member of the union, is a great place to find all these advertisements. Musicalchairs.info has a lot of information about auditions, including a lot of European auditions, actually auditions worldwide, uh, auditioncafe.org as well. Uh, as far as audition preparation strategies, Audition Hacker, my colleague Rob Knopper is a percussionist with the Met Orchestra, has actually done a lot of work uh, on audition strategy, doing different interviews with people, a lot of different psychological training, things like this. It's a really, really kind of a one-stop shop for learning a lot about how to prepare successfully for auditions. So I would encourage all of you who are on the audition trail to take a look at that. Also, the Bulletproof Musician which is a blog site that's hosted by Noah Kageyama, I find is very helpful. I encourage a lot of my students to read it. He's always talking about different types of psychological things to help you get over the hump, whether that's dealing with performance anxiety or different things related to sports psychology. It's a really exhaustive website with a lot of really good information. I think that's worth, worth looking at. Um, as far as score study, there's a few things, or score study and listening. There's a handful of things up there. IMSLP has a lot of a lot of scores that you can find. There's, of course, the Digital Concert Hall with the Berlin Philharmonic. If you happen to be preparing for an opera audition, Met Opera On Demand is a fantastic place. They have archived recordings of our operas going back probably 80 years. I mean, you can probably find five or six different recordings of Salome or of Wozzeck or whatever it is that you have to prepare. It's a really great place to go and look for those. Um, also, suggested reading. I think. One thing that's sometimes overlooked when we're preparing for auditions is the fact that it's very useful to just sit down and read. It's always sharpening your mind in one way, and it's always amazing for me to see how reading certain things can have direct applications to what I'm practicing. Uh, we, as a group, we compile the list here of things that we think are really helpful. Uh, Mental Practice and Imagery for Musicians, Practice Perfect by Doug Limov, I think is a really fantastic book if you haven't seen that one. The Talent Code by Daniel Coyle. Uh, Joy earlier was talking about the inner game of tennis and fight your fear and win. Also, lastly, shameless plug, I wrote an article <laughs> probably 10 or 11 years ago. I, sorry, uh, but, but we printed out a copy of it and it's, it's in the back of the room if you wanna take a look at it. It's kind of a very 
thorough overview of how I've gone about preparing for auditions, and I've had several people who have used it, some of whom have won jobs, and come back and told me that, hey, I used your article and it worked. And it was written for a trombone magazine, but believe it or not, I've had violinists come to me and say, hey, I used your method, and it worked. I won this job, and I went, really? You read a trombone journal? It's amazing. <laughs> 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 Who knew? Who knew? But I think it speaks to the fact that a lot of the things that we're talking about, they, they overlap from instrument to instrument. So uh, with that, if, you, if anyone has any questions or, or comments, please feel free to share them with us. We'd be happy to, to help as much as we can. Hello. Uh, so thank you for giving this presentation. It's very simple but enriching material, and there's just not enough that could be said about the process. So thank you for that. And uh, I do have one question. I had an audition recently for the Philadelphia Orchestra, and um, it was very difficult for me because the audition happened over the course of about a week. Mm -hmm. And so I played my prelim round on the first day, which say I think it was like a Tuesday, and my semifinal round was on Saturday or Friday and you know there's a good amount of hype that comes with advancing in an audition and then there's a few days in between where you're sitting on your couch just like yeah, I'm still hyped I think and I, I hope that I'm I hope that I'm still hyped I think I'm alive <laughs> and I, I'm, I'm not sure I'm not sure if I if that was actually real and it, I don't know there's all these weird little things that go into that downtime and so I wondered if you guys could talk a little bit about what you might do to keep yourself up and floating for more demonstration and more, you know, musical output. Everybody's looking at me, so I guess it's I'll take that. It's in the article, one. right? <laughs> well, here's here's what here's what I think about that. I think it's very important to manage your emotional energy. Um, I always say you should keep the burner on, but don't keep it on high. There's there's everyone only has so many times over the course of a year or even over the course of a week where you can be at your absolute peak level of performance. And sometimes when we're preparing for an audition or when we're in the midst of taking an audition, we kind of put this pressure on ourselves to be at our best all the time. The truth of the matter is you probably need to be at your best for about 10 to 15 minutes at a time, three times, maybe four. Uh, so when you advance on Tuesday and that goes really well, I would try my best to bring my energy level back down and go into conservation mode. You can't turn it off because the job isn't finished, but at the same time, if you, keep, if you keep the energy level burning very, very high and you're constantly thinking about everything that you have to do and you're constantly double checking to make sure that everything that might get asked in the next round is always under your fingers and you're, you're amped up to that level, it's gonna be very difficult to maintain your high level that way over the course of four or five days. So that's one of those things I think takes, it takes experience and, and practice and probably just the experience you had a few weeks ago with Philadelphia Orchestra, I bet you've probably already learned a lot and if you go back and think over the experience that you had of how you may have done things differently or what could have made you perform just a little bit better when you needed to, you know. Um, I know I've had that experience myself. So for me, it's about managing, managing your emotional energy because there's, there's only so many times you can do that. You know, that's, that's my opinion. I'm just going to jump in real quick here, too. Um, sometimes it's not an option, but if you can do anything possible, if there were prelims on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, and then semis on Saturday, I would fake a car accident to get on Friday just so that you can avoid this, this issue because it is difficult to, to extend your energy for that period of time. Um, similarly, uh, I know he mentioned that being asked to play in the first first um, in the hour is not, you know, necessarily automatically mean, that, doesn't necessarily mean that you're not going to advance. I will fake a headache to not play in the first <laughs> hour. That's just me. So, see what you can do. <laughs> see what you can do to advocate for yourself and put yourself in the best possible position because these are huge expenditures of time, money, and energy. And to have something like that where you have four days off um, is... It, it, it's difficult and you want to put yourself in the best possible position if you're going to spend that time. Actually, I was, good. Just, sorry, just one, I feel like the flip side of that is that, like for me, I play my best when I'm super relaxed. You know, I think a lot of us feel like, hey, in the practice room, I'm pretty awesome. 
you know, and in the practice room, you're relaxed. You're not keyed up about anything. You're totally fine. So I want to learn how to play in a pressure situation and be relaxed. So if I had days, great. I'm just going to do what I normally do. They gave me how many days in the city? It's a great city. I'm going to do what I want. I'm not going to think about it. I'm just going to nap when I want to nap. I'm just going to go, you know, catch a Sixers game or something. You know, seriously, <laughs> because I want to just feel totally normal and I want to be relaxed. I don't want to try to like amp myself up. When I amp myself up, that's when I tend to do stupid stuff. You know, so I want to, for me, it works when I'm just like chill, you know, and it's actually, I like having days like that because I don't have a schedule. It's great. I can practice, you know, like whenever I feel like it without getting tired because I don't have to do like four hours in this window. It's like I can practice in the morning, go out, do whatever, and just enjoy being there, you know? Yeah. Hi, I'm uh, Mako Taylor. I'm the orchestra personnel manager of the National Arts Center Orchestra in Ottawa, Canada, one of uh, the top orchestras in Canada. Um, I just had a couple comments. I don't have questions, uh, but I just wanted to mention uh, something that didn't come up yet today. Um, which is the importance of having a very good resume. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, as a personnel manager, I'm uh, weeding through hundreds and hundreds of resumes uh, for every audition that we post. And you might be a, a very viable candidate for the position, but you might not make it past that resume phase. Mm -hmm. um, so I just wanted to, to throw that out there. Um, and then the other thing, as a personnel manager, um, if you're looking for feedback uh, from, from panel members, I just wanted to put out, please ask right away. Don't wait. Uh, wait like I'll have, <laughs> I'll have candidates write to me two and three weeks after the audition asking if they can get comments. Um, and at that point, my answer is probably going to be no. Because um, it is, it's a huge administrative uh, undertaking for us to to compile th the comments and and regurgitate them. Um, so just just ask like the day of or the next day. I would appreciate cool. it. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks for that. I was a quick word regarding the resumes. I mean that that's something that's worth mentioning. In fact, some of the schools I teach, I do a class with the students about how to make a really great resume or cover letter or CV. There are plenty of websites out there that can help you with this, but I think. Make sure that you stick to the pertinent information and put your most valuable, your most valuable accomplishments at the top and the most, the most relevant accomplishments. The vast majority of orchestras are looking to make sure that you have your content information, but after that, if you've advanced previously at a professional audition, put that somewhere near the top of your resume. If you've performed with an Ixam orchestra, put that there. I can tell you, for example, that at the Metropolitan Opera, that's a very clear criteria that we have. If you have advanced or performed with a major Ixam orchestra in the United States, you get invited to the preliminary audition. If you have not, then you make a tape, period. Whether or not you won a concerto competition at your school or whatever, it doesn't matter. So it's valuable to know what orchestras value in a resume. Yeah, and, and please give them what they ask for in the ad. So if we ask for a one-page CV, please just send one page. <laughs> you know? We don't need your life story. Yeah. Exactly, and don't try to cram every single thing right. you've ever done in that one page, Absolutely. which is what you were saying. Yeah. And the other thing is um, the, the resume is necessary sometimes just to get you into the uh, audition. Of course, you can show up anyway, even if they recommend, they, they, they recommend that you not show up, but you can show up. Um, but I have to say, in all the auditions that I've done in Minnesota, they would hand out resumes to everybody on the committee, and they went, oh, thanks. <laughs> no one read them, and all the time that I was there, I've never seen anyone read a resume until someone was really good, and we said, who is this person? Has anybody heard of them? And they go, I don't know. <laughs> then they look at it, so it really has absolutely no bearing on you getting the job or not getting a job. I should let you know that. Maya. Um, my name is Maya Stone and I'm a bassoonist in the Nashville area and second bassoon with the Huntsville Symphony in Alabama. And um, I, first of all, I want to say thank you very much for this invaluable advice. Um, it's so uh, necessary and, and awesome. And um, uh, I was glad to hear you talk a little bit about, um, you know, 
making it to the final stage and then coming out and um, you know you don't want to give them a reason to not right. you know choose you um, so I just wanted to you know kind of see if you guys could address that a little bit in terms of you know that getting to that final stage and walking on the stage and you know how do you um, if you have any advice for how to prepare for that psychologically and you talked a little bit about psychological issues but you know um, that that palpable uh, feeling that you have where the uh, committee might realize that what they didn't realize before <laughs> or didn't even know that they didn't realize, you know. So you're um, asking about like going out for the final round, how to prepare or how, like? What yeah, so uh, like psychologically. You're talking about psychologically preparing for yeah. unconscious bias once the screen comes down. <laughs> basically, is that basically yeah. what you're well, saying? Are you yeah. That's what I mean. Are you talking about yeah, as it pertains to the bias situation, or well, you just right. mean like in no. general? Yeah, no. So actually, I really, you know, I appreciated you about talking about how it, how to um, prepare generally in terms of not giving them a reason, mm -hmm. you know, not to choose you. So just being at your your best and your mm -hmm. top, and you know, not doing you know the um, things that maybe some mistakes, you know, maybe some other people people might make mm -hmm. um, uh, that are common you know for a particular excerpt or something like that but um what i think and titus uh talked about this a little bit in the last panel discussion which when um they talked about being black in an orchestra mm -hmm. you know and what that feels like and you know so i you heard you guys talking about a lot of the preparation in terms of uh technique you know and just being prepared in terms of being a musician mm -hmm. but um you know the the aspect in an audition of, of bias and that, you know, but we can, we can prepare for that, right? So maybe, you know, there, you might have some advice about how to deal with that in terms of psychologically when you walk, because, I mean, that, that has happened to me, you know, mm -hmm. and, but also, you know, Titus was talking about that, you know, where you walk on the stage and you, fe you feel it. So how do you, you know, I mean, maybe yeah. it's not a thing, um, but maybe you just, you know. Well, yeah, I, yeah. I, I can say for myself, like I mentioned earlier, that I, I do better when I'm relaxed and when I'm calm. So, you know, going into the finals, I have to fight the, ooh, you got this, you got this, they're gonna hire you. All you have to do is one more time, it's like, shut up. You know, it's just like the two, yeah, the two, two yeah, exactly. So I'm just saying I need to be calm. Um, I, one, sorry to keep saying Minnesota, but this one, when I, I did get to the finals and I was the only one in the finals, so, I knew they were like thinking me or nobody. I mean, I was the only one there. All I had to do is like, <coughs> like don't screw up, just play a quartet and leave. <laughs> I, I walk out on stage and the committee broke out in laughter. Um, so that was a little <laughs> off-putting. Um, but again, I had to like deal with that and then put it aside. I could either laugh at it, get mad at it, or analyze it, try to figure out what happened later but I didn't have time to think about that so it was more like really just like you got this just easy easy you know it, and it and it turned out that it was it really wasn't even that big a deal it's just nobody knew who I was it, and so someone was like I think he's this Russian dude <laughs> you know and so when they saw a 25 year old mixed kid who looked like he was 17 they cracked up so really yeah Maya I was gonna say I think of course there's a psychological part about of what you're talking about but there's also the actual mechanical part of it and just I think if you're if you're prepared in a way where you've really placed a magnifying glass over every aspect of your playing then that in a way will provide you with the confidence that you need at that time so when you are using your feedback devices in your recordings one thing I would do is I would listen to a recording of an excerpt that I that I recorded maybe five or six times, but each time through a different lens. And you have to hold yourself to a very high standard. And for me, I remember the standard being, can I imagine anybody doing it any better? Period. Because if you can, then somebody will probably show up and they will probably do that. So I would listen to an excerpt through and say, if someone is holding me to a real metronomic standard, if, assuming that that's what's expected of that excerpt, is there any way they could criticize me on my rhythm? Is there anything they could say? I would listen to it again. Is there anything they could say about my intonation? Is there anything they could say about my phrasing? 
Is there anything they could say about the dynamic contrast? And if you put yourself through that, through that kind of gauntlet of, of uh, objective criticism on your own for everything that you do, then you can feel a little bit more confident when you go there that if I play with this type of preparation, there shouldn't be much that people could say. Because with any orchestra audition you have, you're going to be playing for a committee of 10, 13 people, some places you play for the whole orchestra, and every person that's in that, on that audition panel has something different that they desire. There's gonna be the person who's tapping their finger, there's gonna be the person who doesn't take any notes, there's gonna be a person who's just sitting back and saying, I'm waiting for someone to blow me away. In some kind of way, you have to find a way to satisfy the majority of those different types of personalities, and for me, that's what I found to be, to be useful. So. Um, can I, yeah, can yeah, so, Advancing in an audition, especially to the final round, um, is an incredibly high compliment, I think. Um, it says a lot about how the panel feels about your playing, about your background as a musician, and you know, it's, it's an incredibly high compliment. And I think if you just remember that if you're in a final round or a second round, um, that they already like so many aspects of you and your life and what you're about and where you came from, um, I would try and focus on that. And you know, you, you've already accomplished something great. Further than that, um, you know, this day and age, I would hope that people are open-minded to working with whoever as long as they're qualified for the job. But really, and this is kind of my philosophy about working in orchestra, period, there's very little you can do to change anyone's minds or affect anyone's behaviors, really. All you can control and all you can really do on your own is just affect your own playing. Just make sure that you are in a space where you're playing as well as you can and just, just be very self-centered. Don't worry about what other people are thinking or about their reactions. You're there for a job and they already like you, like I said. So that's what I, I would stay focused on yourself and don't worry about what they might be thinking unless you, you know, they, someone does some big grandstanding and curses you out or something. I don't think they're, you know, that nothing like that ever happens. So you just can't worry about what might be going on in people's minds. Hello everyone, John Kieser and the Provost for New World Symphony. Thank you very much for this panel. This is great practical knowledge. I want to offer one more resource that the New World Symphony has curated a website. It's called Musaic, M-U-S-A-I-C, I think that's right, yes, dot N-W-S dot E-D-U. And that has about 700 videos of, of some of the, the great players of this, of this country. Amazingly, a lot of it about excerpts, but Noah's on there as well. So you've got Alex Carr, you have Desmond Hobig, you have Joe Polizzi, you have, have a whole group, and it's basically designed for this particular application. So it, please, it's, it's been sort of, we've pulled material from most of the major conservatories who are our partners to put this together, but Musaic. Uh, .nws.edu. It's going to go through relaunch soon, but right now it's pretty serviceable. Thank you. Great. Thanks, John. Thank you. Appreciate that. Hello. My name is Maria Castillo. I'm from Venezuela, and right now I'm doing my DMA. I'm going through the process of auditioning, and I have a very specific question about the day of the audition. Uh, you prepare, you do everything you have to do, you get to the place and the time you were supposed to, then you get to this beautiful room and you're waiting. You're told for example, you have to wait 45 minutes until you go, and then you are waiting for two hours, and you're still not going. You open the door, you don't see anybody. How do you deal? What tips can you give us to deal with this moment of extreme anxiety right before you go to play? What can we do to calm ourselves and be prepared to play our best after we go through this process of waiting for, for such a long time? Has that ever happened to anybody? Sure. Yeah. I mean, yeah. this is similar to the other question <laughs> that was asked, and I think like managing your energy level is really important. So something that I do is, you know, because I'm, I'm one that's apt to over warm up. You know, if I've got two hours, I've, I've been in auditions where I'll just sit there and play for two hours, and that's definitely not the thing to do. Um, and again, it's if you're just dealing with this anxiety. So bring something to read, bring something to do, um, bring time killers, Sudoku, um, bring some cards, because generally uh, there'll be more than one person in that same situation. And, you know, and I've been in these places where you're waiting around for a long time and you can, and everyone's waiting, you can feel the energy and it, it gets to a point where it's toxic. So anything you can do to remove yourself out of that for a little while until your time comes, um, do it, you know, and figure out where, where, what works best for you. Um, another thing, and I, I've never tried this, but I've heard it recommended, show up late to your audition. You know, a lot of times, 
auditions are going to be running behind or ahead or they're going to try and rush you. And I've, I've had friends that have taken auditions and been, you know, literally pushed on stage out of their out of their practice room, you know, and pulled and they take their stuff. It's just, it, it again, it, it amps up your anxiety level. So, you know, take control of the situation. Make sure you're not being rushed anywhere. Don't go anywhere before you're ready. And, you know, even if you show up an hour late, they still technically have to hear you. It's just inconvenient for them. And it may, you know, you might have one foot in the grave already just because they're, you know, number eight was the one who showed up an hour late, but they have to hear you, and it's, and it's better to, to have that and start there and play well than to just be a ball of nerves and fall apart on stage because you've just been stewing in your own anxiety for an hour or two. I was going to say, I think it's good to, to practice what you're going to do on audition day. Have an idea of how much time you need to warm up before you do something. So if you've determined, I'm going to warm up for 30 minutes, and that's, at that point, that's when I'm physically and mentally best able to play, then try your best to stick with that. If you show up and it turns out it's gonna be two and a half hours, don't think, well, I've got two and a half hours so I should start. Wait and go on the timetable that you established for yourself. Um, and one other thing that you mentioned was you're in this beautiful space. The vast majority of orchestras uh, around the world have, have photographs of their halls. I always found that it was very beneficial for me to look at those photographs in advance. It may seem silly, but it, there's something about the visualization process that helped me think about what's happening. I remember, for example, auditioning in Cleveland, you know, and it's, it kind of goes right in line with what you're, what you're talking about. I got myself a big blow up photo of Severance Hall so I could know what it looked like. I'd never been to Cleveland before, but, and I would look at it, you know, before I go to sleep and I try to imagine myself, visualize myself being on that stage and doing a good job and recognizing what the seats are and imagining where people are sitting out in the hall so that when you finally have that moment and you go out there, you don't feel like this is the first time I've ever been here and now I'm, I'm nervous. And that particular audition, you draw numbers when you show up. I, I showed up and I drew number six and they said it's gonna be two and a half hours before you play because we have a really, really long round. Um, so great, so what did I do? I mean, people are next to me warming up. I went in, I set the timer on my phone and I took a nap for an hour. You know, and I figured if I do that, then I'm gonna have about an hour and a half left. I can, I can wake up, I can relax, and I can start my warm-up routine about an hour before, just like I planned, and then go on about my business. So that's kind of the way I approach it. Hi there, um, my name is Hillary Mercer. Thank you so much for doing this panel. Um, I'm from the Grant Park Music Festival in Chicago. And um, I'm the manager of a project inclusion program, which is an orchestral training program for students 18 to 28 um, that are trying to eventually win jobs. Recently this year, we just transitioned from live auditions for the first round to video auditions, which is something that I've seen across um, music festivals um, and different training programs in the country. And I was just wondering if you had any advice for, uh, that would be specific to a video audition versus a live audition. So for any type of recorded audition, um, I think the number one thing is to start early. The recording process takes a long time, and because they know you've had multiple takes at it, generally what they expect in terms of level is going to be much, much higher. I think they're, quite frankly, a lot more difficult. So start early, prepare for multiple takes, take your time going through them, picking the best ones, and also try and get professionals. And I know it's expensive to do that, you know, and to get all the best equipment you can and people who really know what they're doing, but if you just kind of imagine the money you'd be spending on a hotel and on um, a flight to get to an like any kind of regular audition where you're playing live, um, try and spend something near that on a professional who really has great equipment, who has good microphones, um, and who will be patient with you and who will walk you through the, the process of recording and the process of you know, getting a, a full tape together of, of perfect takes and that you look good and that the lighting is right and all, the, all those little kind of details, um, you know, because you might be being viewed multiple times by multiple people and it just, it just has to be really, really good. So that's what I would suggest for taped recordings. I, w I would add one thing to that is, sorry, I'll get to you in a second. I, li I listen to countless video auditions and, and uh, audio recorded auditions all the time, whether that's for universities, sometimes we listen to preliminary tapes at the Met. Make sure that, that what you do um, is actually reflective of the way that you sound. There's, there's so many recordings that I've heard or seen where the sound is not a legitimate sound quality, it's too boomy, it's too dry, the microphone placement wasn't taken, wasn't taken very seriously. Aesthetically, it's not very pleasing. The person is look, looks very, very far away in the room or much too close. You know, 
you almost get the feeling sometimes that people make a recording and they don't go back and, and look at it to see, does this, does this look like what it's supposed to look like? Uh, so take that very, very seriously because even if you play really well, you, especially with a video audition, you're, you're making an aesthetic presentation of yourself. How are you dressed? What is the camera angle? You know, how do you look when you play? What's your, what's your posture like? All these different things, they, they're taken into account. Hello, I'm Josh Jones from Chicago, a former fellow at the Detroit Symphony. I just wanted to ask a question about being out of school and maintaining a knowledge of where the level is. I know some of my friends in Chicago are out of school. They don't have access to a studio. Um, their friends are like out of town, so they can't really know how people are doing. And when they go to an audition, they're met with like, oh, that's where the level is. So um, any ideas about, I, I know with listening to recordings, that's a good way of maintaining a, s a certain standard, but any other ways you can um, advise? And also, I, I really appreciate this, this panel, obviously, and the visualization um, mentioned at, at the end as well. And uh, it, this stuff works. I, I know this stuff works. You guys are here. And, uh, you know, I'm advancing after having these things with Bulletproof Musician and things like that. So I really appreciate this. Um, I was just going to say um, that you should always be playing for people. And once you're out of school, there's sort of a, a no man's land of like, OK, what happens next? I'm out of school. I don't have a job quite yet. Um, and so you're missing those weekly lessons that you were so used to. But um, basically be trying to find uh, the best musicians in your area to be playing for on a regular basis. Play for your friends. I have an, uh, an audition buddy. He lives in New York, but I met him in New World. Like, we just prepared for auditions all the time. We would play for each other every single week. I talked to him last week because he was preparing for an audition and having a mental breakdown, and I talked to him off the ledge. Um, so <laughs> you have your peers to play for. Um, you should be seeking out um, professional musicians in your area, particularly orchestral musicians, because a lot of the stuff that you're going to be preparing for auditions um, are, are very particular. There's a particular way to play it that um, orchestral musicians will be aware of. Um, and be seeking out the best um, musicians in orchestras that you hope to one day audition for. Because as Ryan mentioned, it would be great to play for the, the people in the orchestra that you're auditioning for. Oftentimes they have a policy that once the audition is posted, like you should not have personal contact with people who are going to be on the panel because it's you know a little conflict of interest. -y. That's not so strict, but that's the general idea. But if you've had contact with them in the past and have played for them in the past, um, it's, it's best. Uh, Follow-up question. Follow up question. <laughs> uh, so, so with dealing with that, also, um, how do I put this? Uh, so dealing with the mentality of when you're doing everything correctly and not advancing. So the sounds beautiful, like as far as the lessons and teachers are te telling you everything's right. You know, the time is right, tune, tuning is right, the style is correct, and you're not advancing. What are you thinking about on stage? Um, well, it's not. I mean, this is a for, this is a for a friend, but um, sure, because sure. Cause, no, because I, I mean, I mean, I can I can say personally, like what I'm what I'm thinking on stage. I'm thinking like, well, I mean, I got to finals at, at Detroit last year, so this is this. Congratulations! So thank you. So like for for my friend, like she doesn't get really get nervous on stage. Um, she plays, and um, you know, she she just kind of just plays. So I I know she she might need more like. More buzzwords and things like that to actually get some emotion behind it instead of just all the technical things. For me, I know a lot of fantastic instrumentalists who just sound great all the time, and they th the the common um, thought is that you know I'll just sound fantastic in this audition. Um, and when I put up that detailed practice regimen, it you need a little something more. You have to have it really. You have you have to live the excerpts for a long period of time so that when you're in these high pressure situations, um, everything is going exactly right. Um, so perhaps that's one of the issues is perhaps the, the practice and the preparation is not quite as detailed as it might need to be, even though yes, objectively you would sound great, but when you're back to back with 100 other candidates, um, it has to be 
uh, a step above that. Um, perhaps examine what's going through your head, um, and if you're having any sort of like critical thoughts or um, negative thoughts that might be getting in your way. Um, I think other than that, it's a numbers game. Sometimes you're going to play fantastic and you are completely qualified for the job and you're just not going to get the job. It's like winning the lottery. I think it's, um, to my perspective on this is that if you're having, or your friend is having, uh, <laughs> <laughs> that experience, that means that the magnifying glass isn't clean enough. Because I can assure you from having listened to countless auditions that no one who's playing with really excellent time, really excellent intonation, great phrasing, and a great tone is regularly not advancing. Uh, that must be a, a misconception in that person's own mind. Now, I've, I, I tell my students this uh, all the time, and I tell you know just friends and colleagues, once you get to the finals, if you get down to the final two or three people, at that point it could be a coin toss, and you could play a really, really spectacular audition, and you could lose to someone else who plays really spectacular as well and a little bit differently or something like that. But if you find that you're regularly not getting out of the first round, there's usually something that's fundamentally flawed in the preparation or what's actually happening on stage. That's, you know, I think there's, there's a method and a regiment to making sure that you become one of those last four or five people on a regular basis. And I would imagine that most people up here, myself included, can say that back when I was regularly on the audition trail, it was the same five or six people in the finals over and over and over and over and over again. And that's, that's not by accident. And they would suddenly start, you know, suddenly it would be one new person wins, one of the people from that group of five wins a job, and over the course of years, one new person enters that group of five, and, you know, over the time, it kind of whittles itself down. But I don't think there are people who are playing spectacular auditions and not seeing any evidence of their spectacular playing in the results. And I've actually been part of this group of people, you know, in certain auditions I've taken. Um, and for me, and it, it's always easy to blame kind of outside factors, like they had somebody already picked or, you know, they just, I just wasn't their kind of cellist. But really what it came down to for me, what I really try and stress with all my students is, you know, each individual um, isn't, he doesn't live in the same world. You know, we hear things at different levels. And if you are if, if your ear isn't precise, if you're not hearing what these very highly trained musicians, hopefully behind the screen, are hearing, then it might not even occur to you that, like, you know, I'm 5% in tune, but the guy behind the screen hears things exactly in tune, and 5% drives him up the wall. So, um, or if it's, like, within a, a stylistic range or a tempo range, um, you know, I've, I've worked with some people who are like, Don Juan goes precisely this fast, not this fast, or on the other side, it goes this fast. and so it, it's it's one of those kind of things where if your ears aren't there, if they don't if you don't have that precision, um, that's something you definitely have to develop, and it's hard to develop. Um, but you know, metronome tuner, making sure you're always playing as much as you can around and with great musicians, um, that kind of helps. Because again, it's if you're not hearing it, it's just you're you're living on a different planet than, than other people. So, <laughs> okay, I think we have to stop there, unfortunately. So thank you all.